Welcome back to Real Vision. I'm Ash Bennington. Today, we're joined by Mish Schneider, Chief Strategist at Market Gauge and a fan favorite right here at Real Vision. I should also say, Mish is part of RV Marketplace. RV members can get exclusive discounts on Mish's ultimate trading program at realvision.com forward slash Mish. That's realvision.com forward slash M-I-S-H. Mish, welcome back. Always a pleasure to have you with us. So great to be here. And the last time I saw y'all was at the birthday party bash. And you know what I learned that day? I forgot to follow up on this. You guys have merch. And I'm like, hmm, I'd like to see some of that merch. So I did go to the website. There's a couple of things <laughs> I wanted to order as a result. You got some cool stuff. Let me just say, shameless plug here, great merch. Like the quality of the fabrics is fantastic. Very impressive. It's even better on uh, than on the website. <laughs> oh, there you go. <laughs> Yay, real vision. <laughs> All right, Mish, switching gears here uh, from merch to markets. Uh, you know, I are chatting a little bit here off camera. So much going on. Big picture, 50,000 foot overview from a macro perspective. What's caught your attention right now? Well, speaking of birthdays, we can say happy birthday bull market, right? Supposedly it's entering its third year now. And um, depending on where you look, uh, I particularly like to look at some of the stats that Ryan Dietrich puts out because he says that the percentages uh, on a third year of a bull market are high for the bull market to continue. And clearly, how can you argue with what's going on right now uh, with the markets making new all-time highs, depending again where you look with the S&P 500 and, and the Dow? Um, and at the same time, what's exciting to me, because we've been here before and I haven't been as excited as I potentially am now, because of the broadening out of where the market is rallying. That's kind of what gets me because it's my economic modern family, right? So if we're looking at where things might go, if we're going to continue, the tech has come off and did not make new all-time highs, which is fine by me. It doesn't need to. A growth-led rally means to me that a lot of money is going in there for passive income because... They don't want to invest in the actual infrastructure of the U.S. or the U.S. centric areas like small caps, transportation, consumer, uh, uh, regional banks. And that's where it looks to me like now where things are starting to get exciting. So why? I mean, that's really what we can talk about today is why would there be a rotation and what exactly would trigger the absolute rotation and not, oh, we just got to resistance and October, Rocktober volatility sets in and we're all disappointed as we come in and it's everything sinks one day could happen right so 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 mish let's let's talk a little bit about that uh you mentioned rotation uh, obviously we've got an election coming up here in just under 30 days uh you see all of the uh deep dives doing the uh, research on uh, if candidate x wins if candidate y wins let's talk a little bit about us equity markets and rotation uh in terms of sectors and investing styles uh what do you see on your dashboard what is it looking like to you well, to mention the election, I mean, how could you not, right, without getting into the political realm, because that's dangerous, uh, I think, for because then you you decide to buy things more emotionally than anything else, because we know campaigns are campaigns and, and, and candidates will say a lot of things and then reality sets in once they're in the seat. But what is interesting is it does seem like the areas that have rallied recently, but not all were more Trump oriented in that what he is talking about is bringing everything back to the United States. Now, whether 100% tariffs is realistic, um, in fact, the tariffs are actually uh, a tax on US, not on the people exporting the, the, the actual goods, which is interesting. I'm not sure he necessarily knows that. Um, but nonetheless, um, the point is, is that market is picking up steam as if it's anticipating some real growth in the U.S. next year. So let's talk about why that would happen. And I don't think it necessarily matters whether it's Harris or whether it's Biden. And that's kind of where I like to step back from the politics. Um, it would be a because the Fed, even though yields have gone up over the last several weeks since the cut, are going to continue to cut. Inflation globally right now, again, numbers came out, UK, 1.7% inflation rate. Oh, yeah, inflation's over. But the good news is, is that will probably create a lot of easing there in terms of not only their policy, but even with the central bank and the interest rates there, which will, of course, help the situation here as well. 
So I think that that what the market is anticipating is the soft landing might be possible. That's so number one, and I'm not necessarily saying I believe that, but I'm saying that's what the market's believing right now. And again, that's all happening uh, before there's a new president. Number two is inflation. At least the worst of it is over. I don't necessarily believe that either, but we can talk about that. Number three is that there will be more and more uh, 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 infrastructure spending here to promote businesses within the United States, which is why the small caps are flirting right now with highs at around that 225, 227 level if you're looking at IWM. And, and, and finally, I think the earnings, which the expectations were kind of low, we've just had a whole slew of bank earnings. Now we haven't had regional banks yet, but the bank earnings show that there's money there. People are get, taking advantage of the savings rate, they're actually investing money in terms of speculating. Um, the commercial loan rates haven't necessarily collapsed the way pe people had feared. And it all sort of builds up on each other, right? So you've got the regional banks, you've got the small caps, you've got the interest rates, you've got an improvement in the economy. And then, of course, the last piece would be uh, the consumer. And that's really, I think, the biggest question mark right now. Yeah, by the way, talking of banks, uh, it's a beat on Morgan Stanley this morning uh, for uh, 3Q earnings. Big uh, beat. Apparently, yeah, big beat. And apparently it's coming uh, from just reading from Wall Street Journal uh, analysis here. It's the wealth management union performing well, which is obviously becoming a more important part of the mix of uh, nearly every financial supermarket on the street. Yeah, even Schwab, by the way. I shouldn't say even Schwab, like I'm surprised. But Schwab just also reported earnings. And again, they also did a lot better than what was anticipated. Um, because the client assets have gone up, which is good. I mean, in terms of the actual profitability of the clients, that did not go up, which is interesting. So people are putting more money into the market, but not necessarily making more money. But we know that can change. The point is, is that Schwab was really floundering and now has had a nice move after its earnings. So it's showing that more and more people want to get into the investment game. Hey, switching gears here just a little bit, Mish, because we talked about growth. We talked about inflation expectations. I want to get your take on what's happening in fixed income, U.S. Treasury market specifically, uh, the shape of the yield curve. What's happening there? What's your take and what's it mean? Well, you know, it, it had uninverted and then it reinverted. And I've been reading about the SOM rule and that, you know, we're definitely guaranteed towards a recession. And that, and that is exactly, uh, I think, the takeaway from all of that is that there is no takeaway, that you have to look at everything for what it is right now, because the rules have completely changed, right? So if you're looking at the fact that we only had one cut and we saw the yields go back in terms of the short-term yields over 4.19%, I think it was yesterday. Now, then, now that they've relaxed a little bit, essentially what you're looking at right now is that, um, you know, let's step back a little bit. If you're looking at some of the manufacturing numbers, the Empire State manufacturing number came out terrible. Our imports weren't really great. I mean, essentially, the, the best numbers we had was in global uh, travel and uh, in uh, what was the other one? Hold on, I wrote it down so I wouldn't forget. Um, shipping costs. Uh, those things have risen, but everything else has sort of been good. So it, but I guess what the yields are really saying right now is that, I'm, I'm trying to try to put this in the best way because I'm not a bond expert per se, but I can look at the relationships. What they're saying right now is regardless of the curve and regardless where the yields are, we're still in a very much risk on environment. And the risk on environment, we gather from two real major things. One is how the junk bonds are doing relative to the long bonds. Junk bonds have been hanging in there which means the bond traders are still very, very optimistic. And two is how the long bonds are doing versus the SPY, the SPY. And that right now, also, the SPY is outperforming the long bonds. So at this point, I don't think we should really be obsessed about yield curve, I guess is what I'm really trying to say. Because until we see the risk factors change, and then we can start thinking maybe more like, oops, maybe that recession that everybody's sort of seen in the back burner starts to come more of a front burner until that point in time i wouldn't i wouldn't worry about it too much that would not be my trading decision at this point what's going on with yield curve it, 
Yeah, and important, and it's it's really just about how you use it. And as you say, as an indicator uh, of risk on, by, by the way, S&P 500 will tell you that. But if you're looking for a proxy uh, for this and you don't happen to have a Bloomberg terminal on your desk, uh, you can go take a look at the ICE B of A US High Yield Index Option Adjusted Spread. Uh, and you can see right now, uh, really tight, under three. Uh, by way of contrast, we in uh, 2023, uh, at the same time last year, essentially, we're at about four and a half. This is the spread between uh, between high yield bonds uh, and safer investments. It gives you a sense of what is happening in the bond market in terms uh, of the general sense of, uh, of optimism uh, or risk in that market. So thank you for that context. So that's great because, um, yeah, I, I mean, that, that's exactly what the takeaway is. It's right now we're still risk on. So don't, yeah. don't, don't worry about it so much. You know, it's so, it's so interesting. I always feel like fixed income markets are almost impenetrable uh, to retail investors. If you don't have a Bloomberg terminal sitting on your desk, sometimes it's just hard to get a sense of what's happening. Uh, but to your point, uh, this is something that you, you sometimes you have the bond market uh, seeming to fight U.S. equities markets. And it's that, that sense of like, well, which, which, which indicator or set of indicators looks right? Uh, but to your point, when you look at those spreads uh, and you look at U.S. equity market performance, it all seems to be pointing in the same direction, which, as you say, is risk on. Now, since we're, since we're bringing up the, the, the bonds, let's talk a little bit for a second about TLT. That's, I, love, I love watching the TLT. And actually, we had bought some TLTs for the discretionary account and even the quants uh, and got out. We're out. We're flat. We have no position in it whatsoever. But And those of you who have known me for years in the Real Vision audience know that I like to look at monthly charts as much as I like to look at a daily chart. Um, and so I did, uh, I did start to write. I didn't finish it, but I'll write it for tonight. The, the comparison between the two. And so essentially, yesterday, the TLTs gapped up and took back out the 200-day moving average on a daily chart, right? So right now, it's showing some kind of a reversal bottom in place, something to keep in mind. However, it's probably noise, because if you look at the monthly chart, I like to look at 23-month moving average and 80-month moving average. And I didn't send you any charts, so I, we can, I can always send these along after. But um, the 23-month and the 80 month, obviously the TLTs in 2022 started breaking down and then even harder in, in, in uh, 2023. And now in 2024, we had one month last month where we were above the 23 month in the TLTs and then we came off again so far in October. We're still below it. And it's around the 96 level. And I think last I looked today, it was trading rack 95 and change. But even that to me is noise because it's a monthly chart. So I'm thinking that if it takes out 100 in the TLT, which it tried to do on its last run, that was the run that we caught and exited, then, then we have to really start thinking, hmm, okay, what does that mean? Does it necessarily mean the end is near? No. But I wouldn't necessarily dismiss that either because now what it's telling you is that the yields are going lower and lower. The TLTs possibly have turned around. And is that because interest rates going lower are good for the economy, especially the pockets we talked about in the rotation? Or does it mean that we've gotten a little bit too euphoric here ahead of ourselves and actually we can possibly even go into a recession in 2025 or stagflation? All right, a little bit of context here. By the way, uh, TLT on my screen trading at 95.50. A little bit of context for people uh, who don't follow this as closely as Mish does. Uh, this is BlackRock's iShares 20 plus year treasury bond ETF. Uh, this trades in the same direction. It moves in the same direction as the price of this aggregate basket that they hold. Uh, so when you see yields fall, you'll see TLT rise uh, and vice versa. Um, but to your point, this is a, ver a very large proxy. I think it's about uh, almost 12 billion uh, in market cap. So it, uh, it is uh, a clearly an, an easily traded proxy because people can pick it up on their, um, you know, on their, on their, whatever their retail uh, brokerage platform is a relatively easy way and cheap and inexpensive way to own bonds or Thank bond you. exposure more properly said, I guess. <laughs> uh, so go let's go ahead, please. No, you go ahead. <laughs> I, I was just going to say, you know, one of the conversations that we were having uh, before this show started that I found really interesting uh, was what's happening in the pharma space, particularly uh, with the drugs uh, to treat weight loss. Uh, I was sort of joking around that I'm one of the few people I know who's not taken these yet. 
Uh, what do you think about this as a broader trend? And then we'll talk a little bit about the price mechanics. Well, you said yet. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I might. <laughs> right, okay. Well, yeah, no, it's true. I, although I don't think people so outwardly admit that they're taking, maybe men admit it more than women, but women generally do not like to admit that they're taking it. So, but I do know that they are because, you know, you see a friend you haven't seen maybe in like a month only, and all of a sudden they've dropped 30 pounds and you have to say, and you ask them, oh my God, you lost so much weight, you look so great. And they say, oh yes, well, I just changed my diet. And you know what that meant. But nonetheless, that's just my little side gossipy thing. Um, I feel like men will tell strangers this. <laughs> You know, yeah, I just, I'm, I'm doing it. Yeah, it's awesome. It's well, that's great because basically what they're doing is a PR for my vanity trade. So that's really what the point is here, um, is that what I'm so excited about, I'm excited about this for a lot of reasons because, you know, personally, that's never been one of my issues, but I do have a lot of family and friends who have dealt with not just obesity and yo-yo dieting, trying every kind of diet that comes out you know, for the last 50 years, and there's been so many Scarsdale diet, one of the original ones from like way back in the day, to now all the keto dieting and the intermittent fasting. And yet as soon as they go off, they gain the weight back again. And that's right. what's the promise of these drugs is that eventually they will come cheaper. Right now it's still an injection. I know depending on where you are, it's like $500 an injection. I've read higher, I've read lower. Weight Watches is even getting into the game of the diet drugs. But yeah, almost, you almost you almost have to if you're in that space today because it's what's sucking all the oxygen out of the news cycle for everything else. But let me ask you this, and this is sort of my one question or concern about it. Are these drugs that you have to take for the rest of your life? In other words, as soon as you start taking them, you have this weight loss, this dramatic weight loss. We've all seen it. Uh, but do you then gain the weight back when you come off them? Is it something you got to be on forever? Yes. But then again, if you're if you're obese, you have to be on statins probably forever or some kind of a heart medication forever. So what would you rather be on? Would you rather not have to deal with diabetes and heart disease and instead have to take, probably will be a pill at some point, a pill or even an injection for the rest of your life that really basically keeps you healthy, keeps you thin. And then think about what happens to your life after that. That's where we're going with this conversation, right, right Ash? Is what is the trickle effect in terms of the consumer and where they might go to purchase. And you're talking about an obesity rate in the US that was between 38 and 40%. That's the US, there's also global obesity, but um, you know we don't have to necessarily talk about it. I even read Japan is getting into the diet drug and somebody wrote me on, uh, and don't let me digress too much, but I thought this was interesting. Somebody wrote me like, okay, why? And Japan doesn't necessarily have an obesity problem. Well, it turns out they have a 5% obesity problem. You know, compared to the U.S., it's not much, but every country's dealing with it is my point. So you're talking domestically and globally, a situation where all of a sudden, even if you have to do it for the rest of your life, what does that mean? Well, it's going to mean different things for men than for women, but there's a couple of things. And by the way, I know many men who do things for their faces, whether it's injectables or they get plastic surgery or they go to dermatologists for light therapy or whatever it is, all of a sudden you're going to want to take care, better care of your skin. If you're a woman in particular, you're going to want to start wearing maybe more makeup, get your hair right. You're probably going to want to actually go out more in terms of dating. Match.com was something we were talking about before is actually looking like all of a sudden it's coming out of a base. Um, so that's where all these stocks like Ulta and Elf and, um, you know, Kohl's, which sells Sephora and all these other stores that will might benefit in 2025 as a result of this newfound consumer. And I'm sure I'm only scratching the surface in ways. Supplements will be also because now they'll want to take better care of themselves. Maybe more of the fast food chains will not necessarily prosper. Ah, I was reading Campbell's Soup actually stock got a buy rating because a lot of the people losing weight, especially in the lower income areas or people who are so busy don't have time to make a soup, are going out and buying canned soup as opposed to reaching for something that isn't as healthy, even though canned soup's high in sodium, but we don't have to go there. So it's, 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 you see what I'm saying? It's like, wow, this is a whole new, this is a whole new universe uh, for, for, for consumer and for buying certain stocks that will benefit as a result of that. 
Misha, are there any names that you're focused on in particular? You gave a number of suggestions there in terms of places where people can look, but are there any that you feel particularly bullish on or particularly bearish on for whatever reason? Well, you know, let's talk about the drug companies themselves, right? So Eli Lilly, of course, um, is one that I think you have to keep your eye on. Um, we're not in it right now, but that doesn't mean that I wouldn't get in. I've just kind of taken a very patient stance to the whole market right here. I'd like to see us get through and really hold these levels in, these, in, in what we were talking about in the very beginning of modern family sectors uh, before I jump in. But certainly Eli Lilly is looking pretty strong. Novo Nordisk had a huge dump, but nonetheless is now looking like maybe it's holding some bottoming action here. So those are the two kind of top ones in terms of the drug companies themselves. Weight Watchers, by the way, I didn't even realize it was like trading like a penny stock. But that went up 100% after that announcement. And then let's move on from there. AbbVie, which has a lot of those injectables in the company. I think that has been trading over 190, holding very, very well. That's another one. And then if we kind of filter down, I've been watching Kohl's, like I said, not so much because of Kohl's and its fashion side, uh, but more because it has Sephora stores in it, at least here in New Mexico it does. I don't know if that's necessarily everywhere, but they made a deal with Sephora. So that's been trading around $20 a share. Again, patience. I don't think you're going to miss the boat. And let's talk about Ulta Beauty because that was on the map when Warren Buffett came in and bought like, I don't know, close to 700 million shares uh, when it was trading at around 330 to 350. It's now trading right just slightly above it. It hasn't moved. <clears throat> Not that Warren Buffett's the holy grail of investing for every stock because he's so much more passive. But what it does tell me is a company like that is on his radar. And that also could be one that could benefit it as more women may go in and want to buy makeup. We bought some Elf Beauty it, after it had a huge, huge correction. We bought it at 105. It's trading this morning at around 108-ish. You know, that would be something I would add to if it can get back over 110. So I think those are the, let me see if I left any ones that I think are really juicy. Um, I, I think that's kind of the main ones that I, oh, no, we mentioned Match. Let's talk, oh, Hims. Hims is another one. Hims, that stock is doing really well. It's just, it's, it's in my Facebook feed, like every seven posts, they're like 12 hymns ads. <laughs> yeah. And, and if you watch football now, they have, I see the commercials every week on the football commercials. So uh, that's good. Um, yeah. I mean, all of these things, but let's talk about match, right? We, cause you, you, before the show, I'm sorry, I'm being very chatty, but um, before the show, uh, you were telling me that um, men who are losing weight from the drugs are thinking about going out more. You know, Bumble, oof, that stock has done terribly, but Match has Tinder and Hinge as part of it. They just changed CFOs, and it's trading at around 58, 59. Again, another stock that I'm watching, I don't necessarily feel compelled to jump in, but it certainly looks like it could be having forming a really nice base on the charts. Okay, now I'll shut up. <laughs> <laughs> uh, listen, while we're talking about these types of stocks, uh, and particularly things that are followed very closely by retail, I just wanted to touch on cannabis because it's got election implications here uh, as well. It seems like uh, you know if we if we just rewound the clock back eight years, uh, both candidates, Democrat and Republican, here extraordinarily. Uh, much more receptive to the idea of federal declassification of cannabis. Uh, you talk to people under like 35 and they just all seem to scratch their heads that there's not a, a federal uh, bill uh, that legalizes cannabis at this point. What, what are your thoughts on the cannabis stocks? It's been, you know, it's been kind of a mixed bag across the board, uh, kind of always, uh, always hotly traded, hotly debated. If you look on social media, what are your thoughts there? Well, first of all, I always felt that it is such a huge growth area and people have argued with me because there's so much competition with growers and things like that, that how do you think that cannabis can go up in price? But it's not the cannabis product itself. It's everything that's around the cannabis product. So it's the sales and the marketing and the advertising and, you know, and then what that entails, bringing in marketing people, bringing in uh, graphic artist people and all of that. And then distribution, uh, that's really where a business starts to grow. And there's a lot of money to be made there and it can be taxed. Obviously it will be taxed. 
So I think that the, the, it behooves the U.S. in terms of an economic standpoint. Uh, and then, of course, then you have uh, pot tourism. You know, I live in New Mexico. When they legalized pot here, um, tourism definitely improved. And it has brought in a lot of money to the state, even though they went crazy in terms of how many cannabis stores there are around. Too much competition. But nonetheless, so that's I just wanted to give the backdrop of the business itself. In right. terms of the legalization of it federally, it's always been a question of when, not if. You know, at some point, the United States realizes that it, it, it's behind the times and has to do that, especially since, you know, most of the country is, is smoking pot when polled, especially if you look at the normal polls, and normal not being normal, normal being N-O-R-M-L, that organization. Um, <laughs> although in some organization people, for reform of marijuana laws or something. Yes. Woody Harrelson's big thing. Right. Um, <laughs> so 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 getting back again, chatty, but I think it's good to have the story around it. Um, MSOS is obviously the ETF that we've been watching. Um, it has been holding above 650. Let's call that probably the max bottom. If it can get its head back above 750, I think that means that the buzz is out. Um, they, I know that Congress decided not to do anything in terms of the descheduling until after the election. And I'm not necessarily sure that Trump would be as pro-cannabis legalization. He has said it. Um, but we know he's classically very anti-drug, very anti, he does, you know, he doesn't drink, he doesn't do any drugs or anything like that. Uh, although Harris hasn't come out and said that she has, she has been very clear about not necessarily wanting cannabis to put anybody in jail and, and, and she's so pro-legalization. So, and she, and even in the last two weeks or so has moved even further in that direction based on her public statements. Yes, and it could be politically motivated. Let's let's face it. That's exactly what happens during campaigns. Is that politically it's all politically motivated in an election year? Oh my God! Campaign? Right? What a concept! <laughs> yeah. So so yeah. So that's it. So let's put numbers: six fifty, seven fifty. Gets through seven fifty. I would jump. I'm already in. I've been sitting there. Uh, my average price is about seven fifty. So um, yeah, I would like to see it take that out. Here's a here's a question that's just come in from uh, Paul E. Uh, and the question is, uh, Greg, Greg Weldon is watching DBB, that's base metals, uh, when it hits 2145 and DBE energy uh, when it hits 2157. Mish, any thoughts on base metals uh, or energy? Wow, great questions. All right. Well, first of all, yeah, um, I have really been trading the base metals through the mining companies, basically GDX. Um, and for a couple of reasons. One is, you know, it's good to trade what you know, and I'm not familiar with those symbols in that I can't drum up a chart in my head like I can about GDX. Um, but yeah, it seems like base metals, another one of those inevitabilities to have to go up, whether it's because gold and silver itself is going up, because the gold miners are going up. If you look at EZA, which is the South African ETF, that's also done very well. It's come off a little bit from the highs, but it's still trading around 49.50, which is a lot higher than where it started. And then, of course, China, you know, you've got to bring China into the equation when you're talking about base metals or any commodity, really. And everybody got super excited about China and all the stimulus. And everything rallied as a result of that when the stimulus wasn't apparently enough for what the street wanted. And then some numbers came out of China show that their economy is still struggling. That came down. But I think China is just like on pause here and is going to come back with another big round. So, yeah, that would benefit all of that. So that's where I feel about the metals. I'm so bullish still in gold and silver. Let me, we just have to talk about that for a second. Yeah. Gold, gold was flirting with 2700 again. It's amazing. It went from 2700 to like 2680 and all the bears came out. And, you know, no, so no matter what we talk about, Ash, no matter how happy the market may look in certain areas, no matter how much it's possible, the rotation to the small caps and the regional banks and the transportation and even ultimately the consumer can happen. That mirror that gold is holding up to everything throughout the world cannot be ignored, right? Those are cracks in a mirror. And so those cracks are not getting any uh, smaller. 
by the Thanks, way, I should, I should just say, just on, on gold, give people a little bit of context on this. Right now, trading on my screen, 26, uh, 74, up on a trailing 12 month basis, uh, about 38%. Uh, this has outstripped the pace of S&P 500, which is up, I believe, around, I'm going to eyeball it, around 33% uh, on a trailing 12-month basis. So, you know, what what does that tell you? What does it mean? Well, and, you know, like I said, what, we, we, you wanted to talk about similarities between the candidates. Here's one. Neither one of them seem to care very much about the debt, or at least they're not talking about it. And they both are talking about spending uber amount of money to support the U.S. economy, whether it's, you know, to prevent anything from outside the U.S. coming into the country, well, that's going to cost money. Um, or whether it's, you know, giving incentives to businesses and, 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 and incentives for using uh, manufacturing in the U.S. or whether it's solar energy or what have you, these are all costing money. And so the debt and the spending, nobody really likes to think about it uh, very much. And that's why, you know, because if you're going to talk about getting rid of it, it's topics that no voter wants to hear, like raising taxes, you know, that kind of thing, cutting back or, or cutting spending. services for that. Yeah, cutting services, spending, Medicare, Social Security, defense. Both candidates are way, way into defense spending. I mean, all of this just costs money. So you have that. Then you have geopolitical situation. Again, we were talking before the show about the Middle East. I mean, that's a conflict that is obviously right now in very high anxiety, but probably not going to go away anytime soon. So what does that mean in terms of economies throughout the world? Does it lead to World War III? I mean, you've got, I don't like to think like that. I'm not a, I'm not a pessimist by nature, but you, know, you can't ignore things escalating. Italy just made an announcement they're going to stop giving Israel any type of support. Um, and I don't know if any type of support, but they did make an announcement about eliminating some of the military support they were giving. So this is creating stress. Um, and that's just one region, a region of the world. So, and then this election itself. I mean, I'm hoping that there's a good transfer of power, but you never know there either. So there's certainly talk about that. So I think that's what Gold's telling us. Gold's telling us that, yeah, celebrate, but be wary of the fact between the bonds, as we talked about before, if they start to really rally in the TLTs and the yields start to fall, if the Fed looks nervous, if China starts consuming more and more materials, the demand on, by the way, raw materials for AI and data centers we know is also great. All of this put together is why gold's sitting where it's sitting. Yeah, Mish, this is always a great conversation when you join us. Uh, this one, especially great. We covered so much ground, talked about so many different things uh, during this conversation. Final thoughts key takeaways that you'd like to leave our listeners and our viewers with from this conversation? Well, you know, we can talk to we're blue in the face, but I am an old world commodities trader, which means what I've learned in trading throughout my life has been price rules. Price pays. That's what you got to follow is the price. So even if you might say, huh, and, and, and with all the issues that we're seeing with the consumer, if something like XRT, which, by the way, has been in a $10 trading range between 70 and 80, 10 months now, 10 months in a massive consolidation. This is, by the way, I should say for anyone who doesn't know, Spider S&P Retail ETF XRT. <laughs> You're so good. I should, you know, I, should, I should have you around me all the time. I love the context. Uh, <laughs> yes, that's what it is. And if it breaks out over 80, uh, actually, I was just looking. It hasn't had a monthly close over 78.98. So let's call that 79. It has not had a monthly close over 79 since like 2022 before the crash. So what does that tell you? I mean, a 10 month consolidation. We spend a lot of time between 75 and 78 right now. We take that out just from a pure technical standpoint. You just follow it. You have to follow it. So that's really what I'm saying here is. Watch the technicals very strongly. Watch the Brussels. If it takes out 227, we had uh, transportation make a new high. That's good. Regional banks are flirting with 60. That would be not only a four-month massive consolidation, but from a monthly standpoint, showing an expansion. And people would say, who would have thunk commercial real estate? Boy, that, that area is terrible. So don't listen to narratives because there's so much of them, including ours. Just watch the price. 
a wonderful note to end on. And by the way, if you're interested in watching Price further with Mish, I should say, once again, she's part of our RV marketplace. RV members can get exclusive discounts on products and services at Mish's ultimate trading program at realvision.com forward slash Mish. That's realvision.com forward slash M-I-S-H. Mish, always a pleasure to have you with us. Always enjoy these conversations. Thank you, Ash. It's so much fun. Always fun for me too. Uh, thanks for watching Real Vision. We'll be with you again very shortly. Have a great afternoon, everybody. Thank you.